Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tragedy on the Ice. My name is Lara Zeeland, and I'm the editorial director of the Bentley Historical Library. And I am joined by my colleague, Andrew Rutledge, who is the library's research associate. And today we're going to be talking about U of M's connection to an ill-fated polar expedition in the late 1800s. This story begins, like many at the Bentley do for me, with a colleague sharing something strange that they found in a collection. In this case, Andrew told me about the necrology file of a young U of M student named Edward Israel. And tucked inside this file was a handwritten copy of a journal article about Edward after Edward died tragically at the age of 25. The article was written by the Detroit Observatory's third director, a guy named Mark Walrod Harrington, who was Israel's mentor while he was at U of M. But here's where things get a little strange. Harrington wrote the article and published it in the American Meteorological Journal, which is an unusual place for basically what's a profile piece. Even back then, it wasn't exactly commonplace for, for faculty to write articles in academic journals about former students, especially ones who weren't scholars in the field. So Andrew and I were like, why did Harrington write this article? What was his relationship to Israel? And to answer those questions, Andrew began to investigate, and he wound up writing a piece in the spring 2023 issue of Collections Magazine based on his research. But there were two problems. First was that I made poor Andrew condense the story to a thousand words, which is only two magazine pages. He somehow did it. I'm still not sure how, but the story really has so much more to it than what Andrew could put in the, to the magazine. And the second problem was that I became absolutely enthralled with this story and I wanted to learn everything I could about it. So I started down the rabbit hole of the Lady Franklin Bay expedition. Fortunately, that means that Andrew and I have a lot to share with you today. And Andrew is gonna kick us off by telling us more about why a U of M student would ever wind up on a dangerous polar expedition in the first place. So the story that led to that necrology file began in March of 1881, when a telegram arrived at the university's Detroit Observatory from the War Department in Washington, DC. It was addressed to director of the observatory, Mark Harrington, and asked him to nominate his best student or his best recent graduate to serve as an astronomer and meteorologist on an expedition the War Department was planning to send to the Arctic that very summer. Now, the immediate question that came to mind is, why of all the observatories and the universities in the U.S., why Michigan and why the Detroit Observatory? Harrington had only been at the Detroit Observatory for about a year, but the observatory had already achieved a national and even international reputation as a leading center for astronomical training in the country, thanks to its previous directors, Franz Brunov and James Watson. Furthermore, Harrington was a leader in the relatively new field of meteorology, the study of the weather. So he seemed like a natural choice for the government to ask for a volunteer. Furthermore, this was not the first time the federal government had asked U of M for an astronomer. A decade earlier, a similar telegram had arrived addressed to the director, James Watson, for an Arctic expedition. Watson recommended his own prize student, Samuel Sharpless Green. Green left at the opportunity and soon was on his way to Washington. But he really quickly realized that this something was a bit off with this expedition. He decided that his commander, a guy named Charles Francis Hall, was really out of his depth when planning such a momentous undertaking, and that the expedition was seemingly incredibly poorly organized, particularly when it came to having enough food. So after some consideration, Samuel Sharpless Green quit. And that turned out to be a rise idea. For the Polaris expedition, named after their ship, was an absolute disaster. Charles Francis Hall was poisoned by one of his men within two weeks of arriving in the Arctic, probably the ship's doctor, but we'll never know for sure. Shortly after that, the ship itself was crushed in the ice, forcing the survivors to slowly make their way south, hoping for rescue by floating on icebergs. Green, having smartly quit this expedition, went on to become the first professor of physics and chemistry at Swarthmore College and lived for another 70 years, dying only in 1941. 
The tragedy of the Polaris expedition was something that was really sadly common among Arctic expeditions over for centuries. Early expeditions by Europeans to the Arctic were primarily looking for the Northwest Passage over North America to Asia and the reported riches of China and elsewhere. One of the most famous of these is the Henry Hudson expedition, the founder of uh, the European discoverer, quote unquote, of New York, of Hudson Bay and New York and Hudson River. This expedition of the Arctic ended when his crew mutinied and dumped him overboard in a small boat with a few loyalists in Hudson's Bay, never to be seen again. The most infamous tragedy, however, occurred just a few years before the Greeley expedition you know, it was the, known as the Franklin Expedition of the 1840s, when the Royal Navy sent two state-of-the-art ships and 129 men to the Arctic to find the Northwest Passage. None of them were ever seen again. But in the wake of that tragedy, a shift occurred in interest in the Arctic, away from riches, the Northwest Passage, and towards a more sort of scientific approach to understanding the region's weather, geology, geography, and this sort of semi-scientific goal of being the first to reach the North Pole. Emblematic of this shift in thinking about the Arctic was an idea posed by, of all people, an Austrian naval officer in the 1870s for what we call the first international polar year. The idea was that a bunch of countries would cooperate, each establishing an Arctic research post who would stay there for a full year studying everything about their respective regions, the weather, the geology, the zoology, the botany, and then compare their findings afterwards at a great conference for the first time give a really comprehensive view of the entirety of the Arctic. Eventually, 11 countries agreed in 1881, 1882 was picked to be the year. And one of those countries was the US. The plan for the US part of this great international polar year was to establish a research base at Fort Conger at Ellesmere Island, which you could see way, way up at the very northwest part of Greenland. The idea was that the expedition would stay there for a, two, not one, but two years, collecting astronomical, meteorological, ma magnetic, and everything other sort of data you could think of. As well as that, it was also hoped that the expedition would prove or disprove the theorized existence of a quote, supposed warm polar sea of warm water around the North Pole, which if it existed, would make it possible for a ship to easily sail to the North Pole if it could just break through the ice. The expedition was to be consist of 25 men, two Inuit, a French doctor, and 22 Americans. Of those 22 Americans who are pictured here, 21 of them served in the US Army because the expedition was actually being served, organized by the War Department. And his commander was this man, Adolphus Greeley. Born in Massachusetts, Greeley had served in the Union Army during the Civil War and received a nasty facial wound during one of the, its battles. And that wound caused him to grow a full beard that he wore the rest of his life, which is why, if you look, you can see everybody else has sort of neatly trimmed mustaches, but he's got this big, bushy beard like he's already been to the Arctic. But Greeley had actually never been to the Arctic. He had stayed in the Army after the Civil War and worked with the Civil the Signal Corps and the Corps of Engineers, primarily on the Great Plains, and helping build dams in the Mississippi River. None of the other Americans in the expedition have been to the Arctic as well. And that included the youngest member of the expedition, and the only clean shaven one in this picture, the astronomer and meteorologist from Michigan, Edward Israel. Edward Israel was born to a prominent Jewish family in Kalamazoo in Michigan in 1851. After graduating high school, he came to U of M in 1877 and was soon one of the academic and social leaders of his class. And he particularly impressed the director of the Detroit Observatory, Mark Ward Harrington, with his astronomical skill. Among other things, he read several of the books written by previous director James Watson on his own and understood them without any classroom instruction, something that really wowed Harrington. And so, he continued to study astronomy, worked under Harrington at the observatory, learned about meteorology. And when the telegram came in March 1881 asking for a student for the Greeley expedition, Israel was the first and only name Harrington considered. But there was an issue. 
Israel's mother had recently died, and so he was hesitant. Uh, sorry, Israel's father had recently died, and so he was hesitant about joining an expedition that would take him away from home for several years, leaving his mother alone during this difficult time. But after talking with her, she encouraged him to do what he thought best for himself and for his career, and so he accepted. But then another issue arose. The expedition was scheduled to leave that summer, and Israel had to be in Washington, D.C. for training and to meet the other expedition members. But he was a senior, and he wanted to graduate from the university. And this was a time when Michigan had a rule that if you did not attend commencement in May, you were not allowed to graduate. That was just hard and fast rule. So Mark Harrington and a bunch of other faculty members actually petitioned the university's Board of Regents, asking for a special exception to allow Edward Israel to graduate, even if he wasn't in Ann Arbor in May. And you could see right here, their letter to the Board of Regents, who, after thinking about it, duly accepted. So as a result, Edward Israel is the first Michigan graduate not to have attended commencement. Now, Laura's gonna tell us what happened when he got to Washington, D.C. for the expedition. So Edward gets to Washington and he joins up with all of the other men and they are on their way to St. John's in Newfoundland in July in, of 1881. And from there, they sail north. They're on a ship called the Proteus that takes them through ice-choked waters, sailing through the Cane Basin and the Kennedy Channel to that red dot that Andrew showed us a few slides back. That's Fort Conger. Once they land, Edward helped unpack all of the scientific equipment that they had with them, like hygrometers, barometers, galvanometers, anometers, chronometers, magnetometers, and yes, thermometers. The heaviest a piece of equipment they had was a 100-pound gravity pendulum designed to measure gravitational forces. And I want you to bookmark that pendulum because it's going to come into play later. They built a shelter, which you can see here. It's a nice lodge that fits all of them. They brought the prefabricated supplies for the shelter so they didn't have to you know, try to build it out of ice or try to find materials because as you can see, the landscape is pretty bare. They were very prepared in every respect. They also located near the fort a seam of coal that had been previously documented in the landscape. So they basically knew that they had an endless supply of coal on hand to help heat the structure. They also built a little shack where they set up scientific equipment with the goal of measuring wind speeds, barometric pressure, gravitational forces, ice steps, tides, and more. And this was really where Edward Israel excelled. He and a few other men took up to 500 readings per day, and they documented everything with scientific precision. And these measurements were very valuable because keep in mind, this is the late 1800s, and people really just don't understand the planet very well at all. Andrew had mentioned that people thought that there might be this thing called the open polar sea, which were warm waters at the very top of the earth after all you got through all of that ice and snow. And they, some people thought that there might even be a tropical paradise up there. So climate, northern lights, magnetic fields, these are still mysteries to a lot of folks and people don't really understand basic concepts about the earth. So these measurements were critical. In addition to the science, Greeley also had another goal for his expedition. He wanted members of his crew to be the guys who went furthest north, meaning further north than anyone else had ever ventured in human history. It was a thing that people tried to do at that time. And at the time, the record was held by an Englishman named Albert Hastings Markham, who set it in 1876. And Greeley really wants to break Markham's record. So he starts making plans for how he and his crew can do this. And in April of 1882, they finally decide that they're ready. And they Greeley sends out three men to go plant a flag at furthest north. And incredibly, those men make it a full four miles past the standing record. And all of those men return to Fort Conger. And when they do return, they're alive and healthy. I mean, they're exhausted and frostbitten and hungry, but they're not on death's doorstep. And it really is a huge victory. And it also pretty much proves that there is no open polar sea at the top of the world, much as I'm sure they wanted there to be. I'm sure a lovely warm sea would have felt great to them at that point, but that's just not how the science works when you get further away from the equator 
And all in all, the Greeley feels very proud at this point. The expedition is doing remarkable things in one of the most inhospitable places in the world. They're setting new records. They're collecting incredibly value, valuable scientific data. And it's all a testament to Greeley's leadership and the quality of his men like Edward Israel. And a lot of this was all due some, to some really good advanced planning. And Andrew is going to tell us more about those plans. This was really one of the most carefully and thoroughly planned undertakings ever in American history up until that point. And that included planning for keeping the expedition fed, finding out how it was doing, keeping everybody alive. So as we mentioned a while back, the plan was that the Greed the Expedition would be at Fort Conger for two years, dropped off in 1881, picked up in the summer of 1883. And part of the plan was because it was thought that it'd be easy to reach Fort Conger every summer with, through the water, that supply ship would be able to come in the summer of 1882 to bring more food, take away anybody who was sick so they could recover in the US. And the second one would come in 1883 to pick everybody up. But just in case that didn't work, the expedition had sailed with two years worth of supplies. So if the, they got there in 1881, if the ship didn't come in 1882, that was okay. They still had enough food for another winter. But it was thought it would come. So as the temperature began to warm in May 1882, the men at Fort Conger began eagerly looking south for sails or steam to show that the ship had arrived. And one man in particular was eager for that vessel to arrive, the supposed second in command of the expedition, Lieutenant Frederick Kissingberry. Just as they had arrived at Fort Conger in the summer of 1881, Kissingberry had decided he actually didn't want to stay there for two years, away from his family and young children. So even as they were setting up their home, he resigned from the expedition. And he was literally running across the beach to get on the Proteus when it sailed away, not having seen him waving at them frantically. So all he could do was grab his supply, his clothes and things and go back to the hut and spend the winter there, sort of floating around, trying to help, but not really being a member of the team anymore. So he was really, really looking forward to getting out of there in 1882. But as the summer went on, no ship arrived. This irritated everybody, particularly Kissingberry, but it was planned for. They were okay for another winter. So they did another year's worth of winter's worth of exploration, scientific study. And then the summer of 1883 came along. Still no ship in May, no ship in June, no ship in July. The waters to the south were wide open. They couldn't understand what had happened. But the summer was starting to get on and they wondered. And what happened to those ships was unfortunate and impossible to know in Fort Conger. The 1882 supply ship, a ship called the Neptune, had been stopped by ice far to the south where nobody from Fort Conger could have known it was there and turned around. The 1883 ship, which was bringing more supplies and was supposed to pick the expedition up, was their old friend, the Proteus. And that was also trapped in the ice, as seen in this picture here. And it wasn't only trapped in the ice, it was crushed by the ice. And the crew had to abandon ship and make their way south in small boats. But none of that was known in Fort Conger, but it was nevertheless prepared for in their planning. The including the thing was of the seemingly very, very small chance that neither ship reached them, that those ships were to leave their supplies at a place called Cape Sabine, 250 miles to the south, which was really, really, really sure it was going to be ice free all year round, so they could do that. So as the summer of 1883 came on and it seemed clear and clear that no ship was coming, really this man had to make a decision. Should they stay where they were at Fort Conger where there's plenty of fuel and shelter and just about enough food to make it through a winter if they were careful? Or should they take the open waters to the south and sail to Cape Sabine where they knew there'd be plenty of supplies for them for their winter and maybe even a ship to take them home? They went back and forth in the conversation, but the deciding factor was their orders were, if the waters were open by Fort Conger, to sail south when they had the chance. So they prepared to leave their home of the previous two years, loading up the several small boats they had, and so confident of they, 
that this expedition's planning was so good and that those ships had done what they were supposed to do that they decided to take, prioritize taking their scientific instruments and their scientific records they've been taking for two years, hundreds and hundreds of pages worth of notes with them rather than food. After all, it was only supposed to be about 10 days sailing. And so on August 9th, they headed south. It wasn't two day, two, 10 days sailing. The first two weeks, the water was open, but it was very windy, very cloudy. They made slow progress. And as Greeley would later write, quote, it was owing to only to Edward Israel's careful astronomical observations being under the most trying circumstances that the time observations could be made and corrected and our location determined in the fog shrouded misty waters of the Arctic. So only Israel's training from the Detroit Observatory and knowledge of astronomy allowed them to figure out their latitude and longitude in those brief moments when they could see the sun through the clouds and mist and figure out where they were in relation to Cape Sabine. They're moving slowly, but they're making progress. Then on the 15th day, ice closed in on them in the middle of the night, and they are forced in the midst of a blinding snowstorm to pull their boats up onto the iceberg before they were absolutely crushed by the ice as you can see in this drawing here. Then there was nothing they could do but just stay on the iceberg and float and hope it made its way south. And so they stood there for weeks, relying on their dwindling supplies and the occasional seal killed by the two Inuit members of the party. Rather than 10 days, it was a nightmarish 51 days before they reached Cape Sabine and the men could escape their icy prison. Their ordeal seemed over, but as Lara is going to tell us, it wasn't. Of course, when the men all got to Cape Sabine, they realized that none of the supplies that they thought they would have were actually there. As Andrew mentioned, one of the rescue ships sank completely with all of the supplies in it. That was the Proteus. And the, uh, the first rescue ship uh, inexplicably only dropped off some of the supplies and then returned home with its hull packed with food and fuel. Greeley and his men found a little bit of food and a few caches of clothes and blankets, but nothing very substantial. It was sub-zero temperatures. It was about to be dark every day for months, and there was no fuel, and the men were trapped by ice from rescue. One of the things that the men carried with them on their journey was their most advanced scientific instrument, that gravity pendulum that I mentioned earlier. It was incredibly value and it was valuable and it was also really heavy. And at one point down in their journey down to Cape Sabine, Greeley tells the men, we can dump this thing, we can leave it uh, because it's just so hard to carry. And all of the men say, no, we really need to take it with us. And it's sort of an incredible testament to how much, again, how much they valued the scientific mission that they were on, that they would carry that instrument instead of more supplies, as Andrew had mentioned. And it's also symbolic that at that moment, when they get to Cape Sabine, when they realize how very dire their situation is, they turn this gravity pendulum, this precision instrument that's, that they dragged hundreds of miles and that they value so deeply, they turn it into a rescue beacon. And that is the photo that you see here. They mounted it just off the shore of Cape Sabine, and that's where they hoped that any sh passing ship might see it. Essentially, the men got to Cape Sabine in, in September of 1883, and their mission now became to survive until the summer months when hopefully a rescue ship could locate them there and get through the ice. This is a brutal and unforgiving landscape, but nevertheless, the men work to build a hut for shelter using one of their boats for a roof. Inside it, they engineer a working stove, and the interior of the hut stays between 15 and 30 degrees on good days. Although, of course, uh, fierce winter storms do blast through the cracks, and at one point, they covered the, the snow covered the men inside their shelter with a foot of snow in one case. They do their best to forage any food, eating birds and capturing small game. They're successful at one point in shooting a bear, which gives them 400 pounds of meat, but even this is not enough to sustain them. Out of desperation, they begin harvesting tiny shrimp that they can catch in the nearby bay, but the shrimp are small and hard to eat and almost impossible to peel. And many times the men refuse to eat them because the shells upset their stomach and 
um, even bringing in multiple pounds of these tiny shrimp did very little for them nutritionally. Making matters worse is that there is a thief in the camp. In one instance, bad ventilation with a camp, sto camp stove nearly asphyxiates the men. And there's this terrible scene where they all have to sort of bail out of the hut, dash out of the hut in order to breathe. And in the ensuing chaos, a half a pound of bacon goes missing. The thief is discovered to be Private Charles Henry, and he's reprimanded by Greeley, but he continues to steal. When the, what the crew doesn't know is that Private Charles Henry is actually an alias, and this man is an, impo an imposter, a convicted felon who was caught forging checks during the Civil War and later was tried for killing a man out in the Dakota Territory. Henry continues to steal and is eventually reduced to prisoner status on Cape Sabine, but even that doesn't stop him. When Even when the men begin to die of starvation, which begins in January of 1884, Henry continues to steal food. And eventually, Greeley has to order his execution, which is carried out with the group's hunting rifle. When the spring arrives, a few of the men set up a tent on a nearby hill, which receives almost constant sun as the days begin to lengthen. They let the weakest men live there, hoping the warmth will sustain them but it doesn't do much good. At this point, Edward Israel chronicles some of the deaths of his colleague and his colleagues in his journal. Friday, April 4th, 1884. Fred L. died this a.m. at nine. He was buried before dinner. Lynn is worse today. Hunter's unsuccessful. Sunday, April 6th, 1884. Lynn became unconscious at 2 p.m. today and died at 7 p.m. Jewel was too weak to tend to ice today. Jens took his place. Tuesday, April 8th, 1884, continued storm. Lieutenant Lockwood died at 4.15 p.m. Jules come later, everybody weak, temperature about zero. Edward Israel's last journal entry was on April 14th, and he passed away about a month later on May 27th, 1884. The day that Edward died, Greeley wrote about him in his journal saying, quote, everyone was his friend. He had no enemies. His frankness, his honesty, and his noble generosity of nature had won the hearts of all his companions. His unswerving integrity during these months of agony has been a shining example. And although his sacrifices were lost to a few, still the effect has produced good fruit. For lack of strength, we could not bury him today. The surviving men had initially buried those who passed away, but as Greeley's journal indicates, as the group grew weaker, they just couldn't dig. As they were able, they would drag the bodies a short distance to a nearby hill where they'd try to cover them with rocks. This was the case with Edward. And at the very end, some bodies were simply left on the nearby ice and vanished into the sea when the temperature warmed. Finally, on Friday, June 22nd, 1884, the surviving members of the Lady Franklin Bay expedition were found at Cape Sabine and rescued. There were only seven of the 25 left. Remarkably, what had survived fully intact were the scientific records of the expedition, which had been sealed and stored and protected as best the men could. The bodies of the dead men were carefully loaded into the waiting ship to be transported back to their families in the U.S. The surviving men were given food and medical care, but sadly, one of the survivors died within a short window of being rescued. That left six survivors to make the trek back to the United States. And here are the six men on their rescue ship, the USS Thetis. In the back row, left to right, is Private Francis Long, Sergeant Julius Frederick, Private Maurice Connell, and Hospital Steward Henry Biedervick. In the front row, seated left to right, are Sergeant David Brainerd and Lieutenant Greeley. And Andrew is now going to tell us about what happens after the rescue. Initially, when they arrived in New York, there was great celebration that the, at least some of the expedition had been rescued. But almost just as soon as they'd gotten off the boat, controversy swelled about the expedition, sparked initially by rumors from sailors that had helped on the relief expedition that had seen the bodies that were taken out of the hills on Cape Sabine, that they had seen evidence of cannibalism among the dead. This controversy took a further turn when the family of poor Lieutenant Frederick Kislingberry insisted that his body be exhumed from the cemetery where it had been buried and autopsied. 
and that autopsy did indeed find knife marks in places on the lieutenant's body where flesh had seemingly been cut off the bones. Greeley and the other five survivors all vigorously and loudly denied there had been any cannibalism on Cape Sabine, and there was no mention of it at all in any of the journals left by those who had died on the, in the Arctic. Eventually, Greeley suggests that perhaps in those desperate final weeks, some of the party had needed bait to catch those tiny shrimp that Laura mentioned and may have cut meat from the dead bodies as bait. The truth will likely never be known, but it's something that overshadowed the expedition in many ways to the day, which is unfortunate, as we'll talk about in a minute. One of the bodies that came back, though, was Edward Israel's. Edward Israel's body was brought to home on Kalamazoo, to Kalamazoo on a special train, arriving on August 12, 1884, less than two months after the rescue on Cape Sabine. Nearly the entire town awaited its arrival at the train station, shutting down businesses and all government operations for that day, which in a time when sadly anti-Semitism was not uncommon in the United States, is really striking as a sort of outpouring of affection for Israel and the, his family. His body was carried immediately from the train station and interred at the city's Jewish cemetery. Today, the only real marker of Edward Israel's life is this Michigan historical marker, which is in the cemetery near his body. However, there's another legacy of Israel at U of M. A collection of 50 Arctic plants he had, he had gathered while they were at Fort Conger and left to his mother who then donated them to U of M in memory of her son. Some of them are still in the university's collections, the bases of our really currently really expansive Arctic plants and wildlife exhibition. And this was one of them. Now I'm going to absolutely butcher the name, so my apologies, but this is Areaforum angustifolium. And if you look closely, you can actually see on the little note card in the lower right, collected by Edward Israel, at near Fort Conger, Grinnell Land, Ellesmere Island. There are several other specimens that's still in the university's botanical collections you can actually see on the herbarium's website. There's an, another sad legacy of the Greedy Expedition that didn't, that wasn't about Israel, but about his mentor, Mark Harrington. The long memorial to Israel's life and death in Bentley's necrology file as Laura says, written based on a longer piece written by Harrington in the pages of his American Meteorological Journal. A glowing peon to a student he described as, quote, a true friend, intense and constant. Harrington continued, undoubtedly carried some guilt over Israel's death with him for the rest of his life. After all, he had recommended him to the expedition despite you know, his concerns about his family. But he also continued his, on in his duties, becoming Another de spending another decade at the observatory, deepening and expanding its meteorological studies. You can see in this photo from the 1880s, there's a weather vane on top of the building, and there's a bunch of scientific instruments hidden by that picket fence in the lower left. So he continued his research, became an even more famous national, international, ma acknowledged master of studying the weather. In 1891, he himself was called to Washington, D.C., to take over the Weather Bureau of the federal government, responsible for forecasting and understanding the weather throughout the United States. But politics soon intervened when the Grover Cleveland administration came in. He was forced out of his office and soon became the first president of the University of Washington, which he was there. He enjoyed working at the university station again. The politics intervened yet again. And after just a short time, he was fired by a new governor because he was part of the wrong political party. So, in entering his, 18, his 60s, in the 1890s, he found himself working as a low-level clerk in the Weather Bureau he had once headed before ill health forced him to retire. But that was not the end of poor Mark Harrington's story. His family moved to New Jersey, and one night he told his wife that he'd be going out to dinner and disappeared. Nobody could find him. But for over a decade, rumors and reports popped up in newspapers and in stories about a highly educated man with no knowledge of who he was, 
working on tram steamers in Asia, living as a lumberjack in the Pacific Northwest in a small shack he'd built into himself, covered with books in Greek and Latin, or spending time in the so-called tramp houses of cities like Chicago with other day laborers. Eventually, his family managed to track him down in an asylum in New Jersey. Though he had no memory of who he was, but was still fascinated by the weather, looking out his window of his small cell every day. Tragically, Mark Harrington never recovered his memory of who he was or his great achievements in life, and spent the last decade of his life in that asylum, dying in New Jersey in 1926. But as tragic as that was, Lars could tell us about some more positive and non-cannibalistic legacies of the Greeley expedition. So what's interesting is that today, Fort Conger, or parts of it, still exist. It's a national park and the site is deemed significant, although there are, of course, um, plenty of threats to it, including increased contamination by humans and invasive species, erosion, and of course, climate change. And while climate change is tragic, and basically this whole story is super tragic, <laughs> I want to leave you with a small silver lining to all of it. And the silver lining is that the contributions of Lieutenant Greeley, Edward Israel, and the other men of that expedition were incredible. Their data was unparalleled, and it matters even today, especially today. That data, it was the data that was collected that tells us that the seas are getting warmer, that the sea ice is diminishing, glaciers have declined, permafrost has thawed. It's the expedition's data that tells us all of this, and it sounds the alarm on climate change. We can thank their unparalleled determination to save the science they collected because that information is one of the definitive ways we know that something is wrong with our planet and it is time to act. It is one way that the legacy of these men lives on. And we want to thank you so much for letting us tell you this incredible story. And we hope that you've enjoyed learning more about Michigan's connection to this turn of the century polar expedition.